how to make your CV and cover letters stand out because um, a couple of my applications have been a bit off the wall and interesting and I've had some positive feedback from editors about those as well um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about um, how to begin a career as a freelance journalist, what on earth a pitch is, where you should be sending it um, and who you should be sending it to um, and then finally I'm going to touch on how to set up your own blog and website because as Tom said I run the Independent which is a communal platform for early career stage journalists to get unpaid writing experience um, and I'm sure there are lots of you that want to set up your own publication, whether that's a music zine or a skateboard zine or whatever it is. Um, I'm happy to help share what mistakes I've made along the way so you can avoid making them. So to start off with, I think when you're facing graduation and your parents are asking you what job are you going to do when you graduate, it can be very easy just to apply for any kind of staff job there is without being super interested in it. Um, I'm here to put you off doing that because applying for graduate schemes is super stressful. There are so many hoops that you have to jump through to get a staff writing job that I am a firm believer that you should only be applying for stuff that you feel really passionate about and that you genuinely want to do and that you would feel proud telling your nan and your granddad at Christmas that that's your job. Um, but also I would say if you're thinking about journalism and you're not really sure if it's for you or not, before you spend any money on a postgraduate journalism qualification, try your hand at freelancing, see if you enjoy it. If you do, then great. If you don't, then you've lost a couple of months. It's not the end of the world. So when you're trying to make that decision between whether or not you should um, go for a staff role or go freelance, here are some things to, um, to think about. So the primarily, primary thing is that the journalism industry is super, super competitive and that has not changed. Um, it's got worse in the COVID pandemic with lots of newspapers and magazines closing or putting staff on furlough. Unfortunately, redundancy has been a widespread thing in the media industry for a long time now. Um, it's definitely something to be aware of. There are fewer roles available. But that said, it's, it's still a vital part of our society. We need people to report on the news, to write features, to entertain us. So there are jobs. They're just hard to get. Um, maybe some of you have got friends that have applied for grad, grad schemes or maybe you've had a look at some of the application processes yourself. Either way, they're quite intense processes. Not only do you have to submit a CV and cover letter, but often there's a multi-stage interview process if you get in the door. Um, and that can involve a combination of practical writing or breaking news exercises, as well as more traditional interviews about your skills, interests and your experience and your interest in that specific publication. So it can be quite emotionally draining applying for graduate schemes and it's quite stressful to know that all your peers are doing the same job, going for the same jobs as you. So my number one bit of advice is to only apply for jobs that you really, really want and where you genuinely read the publication because if you don't read the publication, then even if you get an interview, you're gonna betray yourself in the interview. Um, and there's no, it's not an exam, you can't last minute cram and pretend that you're aware of a brand that you're not aware of. So only apply for jobs that you actually genuinely want to do and make sure that they're publications that you can see yourself writing for because you read them. Um, think about job security as well. So a staff writer role offers lots of benefits, including a, a reliable source of monthly income. So if you're renting, especially in an expensive city like London, that's definitely something to think about. Um, in marked contrast, freelancing is very unpredictable in terms of income. For a lot of people, it's very feast or famine. So one month you might have loads of commissions and make loads of money, um, but the next month you might not have as much luck. So you need to be really good at money management and project your cash flow and make sure that you've got enough coming in to cover all your bills. So in terms of weighing up the two, there are different, definitely pros and cons to each. Um, if you do go down the staff writer role um, and you're put off by a lot of the competitive grad schemes, one thing I would say is think about working for a trade magazine. Um, so generally these are less competitive. Um, you have to do a bit of scouring on the internet like Indeed and um, other job search websites to find the roles, but um, there are gonna be fewer applicants for those kind of positions. It could be a good way of getting some experience in print or production or subbing or whatever you're interested in. Um, rather than going for those more competitive schemes. Um, and one thing that I just want to stress is um, even when talking to Tom um, in the run up to this conference, I, um, I call myself a freelance journalist, but I don't freelance full time. I do it around a day job in marketing. And that's quite a common misconception a lot of university students have about journalism or freelance journal journalism in particular. Um, and that's the idea that you can make enough money from freelance journalism alone to be able to financially support yourself. Most people I know that call themselves freelance journalists have other jobs. So they either work in marketing, copywriting, PR, 
or they have part-time jobs in hospitality or they work in a, a in H&M there are so many different things that you can do alongside a, a writing career and um, that you can manage to fit in pitching and, and writing as well and um, so don't feel like you're a failure if you feel that you have to take on a different job to make enough money to live that's quite common most professional journalists that you know and that you admire are also doing other things on the side whether that's guest lecturing they're doing consultancy or they're running their own newsletter so don't worry too much about that but let's say you are going to go down the graduate um, scheme route or you're going to apply for a staff writer role um, what can you do to make your application stand out so in terms of CV and cover letter design, um, I think it's really, really important to spend lots of time on very few applications rather than not much time on loads of applications. You should not be sending one CV to 10 different papers. You should be custom designing your CVs and, and adapting your CV, CV so that it's got the most relevant experience and the most relevant clippings um, for that publication. You should also be addressing your cover letter to whoever's going to be reading the application. So if you don't know who that's going to be or if it doesn't say in the in the advertisement for the role, give the HR team at the paper a ring and ask. This shows one that you're, you can use your initiative and two that you have another really good skill that journalists need, which is the ability to phone strangers up and ask them for information. Also, don't be afraid to be um, funny. So in my application for the Telegraph graduate scheme, which I applied to last July, I think it was, I made a joke about having had loads of time to um, perfect my banana bread recipe and I just put that at the end of my application thinking that if someone's reading 10 different cover letters maybe it would be nice to make them laugh. Um, there's also no point in putting loads of effort into designing a really cool application if you're going to send it off for the basic errors. So make sure that you buddy up with a journalism friend who has different interests to you. So maybe they're going for a news role and you're going for a features role and offer to read each other's CVs and cover letters before applying for roles. Also, I'm a big advocate of printing your work out and reading through it with a red pen. It's so much easier to see errors when they're on paper than it is on the screen. And also, similarly, if you're in the position where you have a lecturer that you really admire, maybe you have a journalism mentor, or there's someone that you really admire who's a couple of years older than you that you met while you're doing student journalism, send them a DM, say, have you got any free time to look over my application? And more often than not, you'll find that people are really happy to help you. So here are two examples of CVs that I sent to national newspapers. So I got interviews for both The Times and The Telegraph. Um, I'm definitely not advocating that you all go away and design CVs that look like the front page of the paper. To be honest, if you all did that, then the editors would get bored of this really quickly. But the, import, the reason I'm showing you this is to show that it's important to find ways to show rather than tell people you're good at something. So for instance, I used InDesign for this. And this shows that I can use InDesign. I didn't have to say I am good at InDesign because clearly my CV shows that. Um, similarly, if you've got really good coding skills, maybe you can incorporate that by coding a digital CV and sending it that way. Um, Canvas is a really good tool. If you're not very tech savvy or you've not got InDesign experience, I can really recommend that in terms of using that to lay out your CV so it looks nice. Um, and Job, Jobs Board is a really good podcast for young journalists. Um, that gives loads of great advice about how you can make sure that your CV doesn't get rejected at the, the very first stage by being read by a robot that doesn't even care about who you are as a person. It's just looking for formatting. It's just looking for keywords. So definitely recommend their podcast. Check it out. Um, and there are also so many different ways that you can showcase your, yourself and your personality. These are obviously for two national newspapers, but I've, I've included a couple of other examples. Mm -hmm. Um, just to show you guys what you can do. So this was for some work experience that I did when I was at, I think I was at university at the time, um, so I was a soon-to-be graduate, and I basically applied for some work experience with a, a brand agency called The Writer, um, and because they're a, a language agency that specialise in, in marketing and advertising, I framed my application as a personnel's column. So as you can read, it's basically me just twittering on about how, how much I like writing and words. And I was playing around with it as being a bit silly and informal because that was the tone of the publication. Um, similarly, that was the end of the, the it was two bits on one page. Um, and that was just a mock-up of like an advert um, just to show that I was familiar with what a newspaper page looks like. Similarly, I applied for some work experience with uh, Waitress Food magazine way back in 2018. And again, I designed my CV to look a bit like a magazine. It's obviously not 
identical. It, it doesn't look exactly like the Waitrose Food magazine, but the point is I'm showing that I read magazines, that I care about the pub publication, and most importantly, because it's Waitrose Food, I've included a picture of me eating a pizza. Um, so again, don't be afraid to use photos on your CV, play around with graphics and design, and make sure that you're including links to your social media and also your LinkedIn and your portfolio website if you have one. Um, I'll talk a bit more about portfolios later on. So say you've done all that and you're, you're really keen to get a staff role, where do you find out about these kind of jobs? So there are so many great journalism newsletters. Um, Journal Resources is a fantastic resource for early career stage journalists. Um, they have a weekly newsletter which has lots of freelance and also staff writing um, positions and opportunities. Uh, Lance by Anna Kudrea Rado um, is a really good newsletter. That's about being a freelancer, um, but it has some really great like advice and guidance for staff writers as well. Journalism.co.uk have a weekly um, journalism job alert, which you can subscribe to. And then also there's my own newsletter that Tom mentioned at the very beginning called The Peak District. Um, and that's specifically geared around jobs and um, media op media and journalism job ops, not, not in London. So that's things like marketing, copywriting, social media, um, all the kind of things that you can do alongside a freelance writing career and make sure that you keep the lights on at the end of the day. Um, also recommend using job search websites, but don't just type in journalists, make sure you're typing in things like media, editor, reporter, because if you just type in journalists, often you'll miss things, um, because lots of different terminologies are used across these postings, but a lot of the time it's the same job role, it's just a different word for it. Um, and you can also cold email editors. Um, so I've never done this myself, but I know people that have and it's been successful for them. You basically just email and say, I'm a journalist, I've been published in X publication. Do you have any freelance uh, reporter shifts available? And then they'll come back to you and they'll, they'll ask about availability and things like that. Um, one thing to be aware of with that is that you may need a journalism qualification to get those shifts. Um, because a lot of national newspapers and even local newspapers are reluctant to take on anyone that doesn't have media law training. Um, and that's just to cover themselves legally, really. So just be aware of that if you're thinking about doing that. Um, so say staff writing, it's not really your bag or you're not really convinced yet that journalism is for you and you just want to dip your feet into it and see whether it is for you or not. So this is where freelancing come in, comes in. Um, freelancing is, it, it comes from a medieval word um, and it's when soldiers sell their swords to the highest bidder, which I think is quite cool. It's basically just selling your ideas to publications that will pay you for them. Um, and the way it works is that you email an idea to an editor, and this is called a pitch. So a pitch is just a basic outline of your idea. It's really important that you don't send pre-written articles because more often than not, um, that's not what an editor wants. They want to work in conversation with you to shape the piece, to make sure it's a good fit for their publication. And you'll just be wasting your time if you send them the full article. Um, there are some exceptions to that. So for, for instance, I think Buzzfeed Reader ask for the full article, um, but more often than not, they just want an outline of your ideas. Um, so a pitch, I'll go into what a good pitch looks like slightly, slightly later on. Um, but basically um, you have a conversation with the editor. You say, this is my idea. In an ideal world, they'll come back to you and they'll say, yes, we love it, we want to commission it. But more often than not, you will either not get a reply or you'll get a reply saying, no, nope, not for us. So be prepared for lots of rejection, be prepared to get ghosted by email. Um, it's really important that you have a really thick skin and you don't take it personally and that you keep going. I've been doing this for a good six months now. And for instance, this month, I think I had about an 8% um, success rate in terms of the number of pitches that actually got pitched up, picked up. So you have to be really resilient. You have to have lots of ideas and you have to constantly be reading in order to have um, those ideas. Um, so once an editor has come back to you and they've said, yes, I like your idea, I'd like to commission you, you can have a conversation with them about money. So often they'll offer you a fee. If you're feeling confident that you deserve to be paid more, you can question that. You can say, actually, I, I was thinking more in line with this sum. Um, again, journal resources is a really good resource for checking that you're being paid fairly. You can also um, ask your freelance journalism friends um, and people on Twitter for advice if you're a bit worried about the rate or you don't know what the industry standard is. Um, and then once you've agreed on a fee and a deadline, you would start writing the article in line with the brief that the editor has given you. So quite often, this is quite different to student journalism in that often when you pitch as a student journalist, you get a yes or a no, and the editor might not necessarily give you much feedback in terms of where to take the pitch. 
Um, but often with a national or local news website, for instance, they will say, yes, make sure you include this, this and this, or I want the angle to be this. Um, and that means you need to deliver what they, they're asking for. It might not be the same thing that you originally pitched. Um, so just be aware of that. And if it, it's something that you don't want to write, go back to them and say, like, I, what, that wasn't the angle that I was thinking of. I'm really sorry, but I'm actually going to take this elsewhere. For instance, if it's a personal story that is really important to you, um, don't be afraid to push back if they're trying to change it too much beyond what you want it to be. Um, and then again, once you've written the article and you've submitted it within that time frame, it's really, really important to be aware that the edit process is part of the writing process. Um, again, lots of student journalists often get their work published by brilliant editors that um, are their peers and their friends and maybe don't feel as confident editing their work substantially. But when there's that um, more hierarchical power dynamic between an editor and a freelancer, um, an editor has a much better understanding of what makes good writing, what makes it good for their publication. Um, and as such, you're probably going to get quite a lot of edits on the first piece of work that you ever do. This is not to say that you're a terrible writer or that you should never pitch that person ever again. That is the editor's job. They're, they're sole role is to take your writing and to make it better so do not be offended if you get a google doc that's covered in comments saying can you add this can you change this can you reorder this that that is to be expected and it doesn't mean you're terrible at writing so just be aware of that um when you're pitching and then say you've made the amends that your editor has asked you to make or maybe they made them for you and then they just asked you to double check that you were okay with it and um, the article will be published and then you can invoice for the article um, so most publications only pay upon publication, which is frustrating because often that can be up to two months after you first pitched the idea. Again, goes back to that money management thing that I said, if you're thinking about freelancing, you need to be really good at knowing when you sent the invoice, when you deserve to be paid by and having term late terms, which are when you basically charge the publication more if they are late in paying you. Um, but again, Journal Resources is really good for giving you more detailed breakdown about how to invoice and late fees and information about things like that. I can't possibly cover all of that today. Um, there are some great publications that are really good at paying upon submission of the copy. Again, do your research, find out whether it's important to you to get paid upon publication or on commission or, or what. Um, and then when it comes to finding these freelance opportunities, um, there is a really, really good weekly newsletter called Freelance Writing Jobs by Sharmeebs Williams. She is an incredible journalist. Follow her on Twitter as well. Um, she's also written a book um, called The Pajama Myth, which is out soon. Um, so definitely pre-order that um, because it's about myth busting of the freelance writing career. Again, Lance is a really good opportunity um, newsletter and also just activism and feeling like part of a community because one of the benefits of having a staff writing role is that you have colleagues and you have people that you can bounce ideas off. Freelancing can be lonely at times, but that's not to say there aren't communities and spaces online where you can find your own colleagues. And the best thing about it is you get to pick your colleagues as well. So obviously I've got an amazing team at The Independent. Like I can't complain at all about working with people like Tom. Um, but you can find your own tribe of people and you can um, surround yourself with people that like, you really admire and that you want to be more like. Um, another newsletter here is Opportunities of the Week. Um, so that this is a paid newsletter. Um, I think it costs about three dollars, um, but there are also options to subscribe to it and get a um, free subscription if you can't afford that. Again, goes back to the, the tribe kind of thing that I was just saying. There are so many really great Facebook groups for freelancers. Um, search the words freelance and journalist. I would especially recommend the young journalist community, which is lots of young people um, like myself and like Tom and everyone else. Um, just asking questions and don't be afraid to ask stupid questions as well. Like everyone has to start somewhere. There is no question that is a stupid question. Um, lots of people are really kind and generous in giving out editorial contacts. So for instance, you want to write a feature for Vice, you could say, I'm writing a feature about sex and drugs for Vice. Like, does anyone have a good contact? People would reply and give you the name of the most relevant editor. Would definitely recommend that. Again, the Journal Resources Facebook group, group is great. But one thing that you can actually do, as much as these newsletters are incredible, they land in thousands of people's inboxes at the same time every Thursday, which means those editors for those pitch callouts or those opportunity callouts get thousands and thousands of emails from people exactly like me um, saying, 
pick, pick me, pick me. So one thing that you can do to get ahead of the curve is by using TweetDeck to monitor those opportunities in real time. So I'll show you a bit what this looks like. So it's, I think it's tweetdeck.twitter.com. Um, and you can just type in keywords that you want to monitor. So things like pitch me or um, commission or the local area that you're from. So for me, that's Sheffield or music, which is something that I'm interested in um, in terms like freelance journalists as well or looking for pitches. And then you can also follow the journal request hashtag. Um, and that's just to give you an idea of what other people are, are writing about. And it might trigger something in your brain that's like, oh, I've got a different angle on that or I can make that local to me and, and basically steal other people's ideas, but and steal them and adapt them, don't just steal them. Um, but this is a great way of keeping up to date with what editors are looking to commission people. Quite often there might be a breaking news incident and an opinion desk is really keen to get someone on it really quickly. So this is a place, Twitter is a place to be as a journalist. It is, you can't really be a, a journalist and not use Twitter. I have to have to say that as someone that has spent her entire adult life on Twitter. Um, but definitely recommend TweetDeck. That's a great resource. And then say you're writing a pitch itself, you've got a great idea, what should a pitch look like? Um, so every journalism masterclass I've been to, every editor has different pitching advice. What I've tried to, done, uh, to do here is condense the majority of the advice into the bare bones because there is lots of contradictory advice out there, but this is what works for me. Um, this is the pictures that have been the most successful. So I put the word pitch colon and then I put a headline that would work on the piece. Um, often that ends up being the finished headline. Sometimes it might get changed a little bit in the edit process, but it's really, really important for you to be able to coherently summarize your idea quickly because an editor is busy. They're going to scan your email. If it doesn't make sense what you're trying to write about straight away, they're not going to read it. They're not going to read down to the bottom um, and read a 10,000 word explanation of why you want, want to write about snails. They're just not going to do it. Like, you need to be realistic. So keep it short and snappy, aim for two or three paragraphs maximum. Um, and your pitch should make sure that you explain what you want to write about. And to be clear, that isn't, I want to write about feminism. Um, it's a very specific newsworthy topic within feminism and you need to give the details. So if it's about the effect of COVID on the unpaid domestic labor gap, for instance, which is a piece I wrote for the independent, you need to link to the relevant supporting materials. So for me, that was a, a UN women survey that that showed that COVID has made that worse. Um, so link to relevant statistics, make sure you're linking to up-to-date statistics as well, not anything that's out of date, and then explain why you are the person to write this. So why could the publication, say it's the Metro, why can they not just get one of their staff writers to write it? What makes you uniquely qualified for the, for the, for the job? So for instance, if you've got personal experience, include that in your pitch. So for instance, one of my recent commissions was a piece on Bridgerton um, for Cosmopolitan. And the reason that I landed that pitch was because I wanted to complain about the fact that the sex scenes in that show are very kind of fallow centric and they frame sex as this male, like they were trying to be really progressive by including oral sex scenes with a, a female actress. But in doing so, they kind of created unrealistic expectations about how long it takes a woman to orgasm. And it also just framed the whole it was just terrible. The sex scenes in Bridgeton are awful. But anyway, I wrote about that as a bisexual woman and I talked about my experiences of sex not being a phallocentric act. And that was my personal take. That was why I was the one that got that commission rather than, say, a white cis male that has only ever had phallocentric sex. Um, so make sure that you're being really assertive and you're, and you're saying, like, I'm the person to write this piece because of X, Y, Z. Maybe you have a politics degree and it's a political op-ed. Maybe it's that you had a really horrible breakup during lockdown and you want to write about lockdown breakups, whatever it is, stress the why you, because that, that is what's going to make an editor look at your pitch and go, oh, yes, I have to commission this person rather than just giving this idea to my colleague that works on the desk two doors down. And also you need to explain why the publication should be pitching this now, publishing this now, sorry. So why is it newsworthy? So it might be linked to something that has happened in the last few days. Maybe it's to do with the free school meals and Marcus Rashford. Maybe it's to do with an anniversary. So um, the Arctic Monkeys album was recently turned 15. So maybe you want to do a retrospective review of that. So just stressing your pitch why it should go up now. Um, but if it is a more evergreen feature, so one that will always be relevant, what you should be answering is why it's relevant to that publication, i.e. why would it interest that publication's readers? Is there another article they've published that's similar? Have they profiled a famous band before that you're talking about the album? 
do your research, have a look what's already been published on that website before you um, pitch. Um, and then in terms of when you should send pitches, lots of people disagree about this, but general consensus is first thing in the morning, Monday to Thursday. And if you're generating ideas on the weekend, you can use email scheduling tools. So Gmail is great because you can schedule send on Gmail. I'm not sure about other email clients because that's what I use. Um, I would, as a general rule of thumb, avoid pitching on the weekend unless you know it's a desk or an editor that works on the weekends, just because by the time they come in on Monday morning, they're going to have hundreds and hundreds of emails. They're probably just going to ignore them and start again. Um, for anything super time sen sensitive, feel free to put urgent in the subject line. But if it's not urgent, don't put urgent in the su subject line because you're just going to piss the editor off. Um, you can also say things like, if I don't hear back within 24 hours, I'm going to pitch this elsewhere. And it's really, really polite to let an editor know if you're shopping an idea around different places, because it's really frustrating if an editor comes back with a really long brief saying, I'd love to commission this, could you turn it around by X date? And then you go, oh, I'm really sorry, I actually just sold this to the Times. So be honest, if you are gonna send it to multiple places, and I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that, just be transparent. Um, and then in terms of the etiquette with following up on pitches, um, definitely don't just leave it without following up because more often than not, an editor just will have missed your email because they get hundreds. So send a chaser within a week if it's not time sensitive. Um, if it is time sensitive, you can do within 24 hours or maybe 48 hours. And then if you don't hear back within a week, then try again three days later before you either move it to somewhere else if it's still relevant or you drop the idea and you move on. Um, one thing that I would really recommend doing is keeping a record of all your successful and non-successful pitches. So this is my sheet. I'm not going to zoom in just because then you can see all my ideas that I'm still trying to shop around. Um, but I colour code it. So the red ones are the ones that were rejected straight up. The orange ones, I either got an editor's out of office. I got a, this is great, but we don't have any money left, i.e. we can't pay you for it. Um, the grey ones are things that didn't get a reply and then the green ones are paid commissions and blue ones, which I don't have any so far this year, are unpaid work. Um, so have your own system. There are lots of different ways that you can organise it. But I think the single best thing that I did for my writing career last year was actually holding myself accountable, having a look at what I'm doing well each week and what I'm not doing well um, and reflecting on my own processes. For instance, I used to send pictures in the evenings. And I just never used to get replies, but ever since I've shifted to do, doing the morning pictures, I've got so many more responses. Um, and as you can see there, the two commissions were on Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, I mean, there's not a huge amount to go off there, so don't read too much into that, but maybe avoid Mondays. That's just a thought. Um, in terms of an example of what a good pitch looks like, this is one that I sent for the Cosmopolitan piece. So as you can see, I'm straight in there with the bold. Thing. This is what I'm covering. Um, this is what I want to write about. And then I've said what my argument would involve. And then I've said um, why I'm the person to write it because I'm bisexual and because I wrote my dissertation on Jane Austen. So I understand the Regency period. I understand the conventions of dating and the traditions that this um, period drama is set. Um, and then I linked to three recent examples of my work. So generally, I would say two to three relevant clips. Um, if you don't have loads of bylines, it's fine just to put whatever you have to begin with, at least. Obviously, further down the line, you'll have the luxury of choice um, and you can also link to your full portfolio. Um, and then P Paisley came back to me and she said yes. And she gave me a brief and she said, can you include X, Y, Z in your article? Um, and then the piece got published. So as you can see, that's three paragraphs, really, with a couple of links. Um, so it's short, snappy, don't waffle on um, and give it a working headline so that people can see immediately what you want to talk about. So in terms of the best publications to get your first byline with, um, these are three that I know are particularly good at working with um, early career stage journalists. So Metro is great, although they, they don't pay as much as other nationals. So that's something to be aware of. Um, Indie Voices is really good for anything opinion or political. Um, they're really good. Um, I, I think it's Chris is the editor there, Christopher, um, and also Rupert at Indie Voices. Um, and then Vice is great. And then it's not on the slide, but um, Refinery29 is really good. Jessica Commons is their lifestyle editor. So that's obviously a women's um, primarily publication. So that's a good one for any lifestyle writers. And then for music journalism, Eleanor Halls is the culture editor. She's really good at working with female music journalists in particular, but any music journalists, um, definitely pitch to her. She's really nice, really responsive. So then finally, we turn to setting up your own blog and showcasing your own work. So for me, I have a site called bethkitbride.com, which is just hosted on the free version of WordPress. 
everyone always says like, oh, how much do you pay for that? And I don't pay anything. I just use a basic theme and then I've customized it. So I've added the logos to the publications that I work for. And I've got a breakdown of the recent articles in terms of hyperlinks. I've got all my social links. I've got an about page. So that just tells people a bit more about me. I've got a link to my day job so that people can see the marketing work that I do. And then I also have a news um, tab, which I don't know if you can see, but that's on the far right. Um, and that's just a list of all my recent work. Um, so one thing you can, you might get in trouble for is if you just copied and pasted articles that were published on a national news website. So what you can do is you can just say, um, here's a link to an article I wrote for the Telegraph and then hyperlink to the, the website that the work was actually published on. That way you're not duplicating any content, you're not getting in any trouble. But if in doubt, just ask the publication if they would be okay with you republishing your work on your own blog. Um, more, more often than not, they'll say no. So I use WordPress, but there are other options that you can use. Lots of people use Wix. Um, Medium is really good for earning money on your work. Um, so it's an American publication, uh, American corporation, and you can sign up for a Medium partner program account, which basically just means that all of their subscription um, fees get distributed over people that are in the Medium partner program. And it's based, it's a complex algorithm that takes into account how much people read your work, how much they engage with it. So if you're looking for a bit of extra pocket money between now and graduation, definitely recommend um, writing on Medium. There are lots of Facebook groups that you can join to promote your Medium work. Um, so have, have a search, just the word Medium or Medium Writers on Facebook, they'll all come up. Um, other people use Tumblr, especially if you're more visual. Um, Tumblr is really good and you don't have to have very good coding knowledge as well to set up a website. Uh, so don't be afraid to be creative. So this is a really um, great example of a um, journalist called Shelby Cook, who writes for The Independent. She is um, primarily a film um, journalist. So she made movie posters and film and TV posters out of all of her reviews. So down here is a quote from her review. Um, and I just think that was a really nice visual example of how to showcase what you're capable of, capable of and also adapting your CV for the medium that you're writing in. Um, so just a few like last four thoughts really before I open this up to any questions. If you're setting up a collaborative blog or website like The Independent, what I would stress is that it's really, really important that you have a USP. Um, so you know what you're offering and what makes you different from everyone else out there. There are so many great media blog, um, brands and websites that it's really, really important that you know what sets you apart from the crowd. So for me, when I was setting up The Independent, I was 17. I was in my parents' house. I was really frustrated because I wanted to go to university and I wanted to write, but I didn't have a, a school website or a publication I could write for. So I thought, why not set one up, get my friends involved um, and get some feedback on my work. And that's what I did. And then within a couple of weeks, I had people from sick forms across the country saying, can I get involved? And it basically snowballed into a massive, like, it's basically a communal portfolio website um, and it's very peer to peer. So there's not really any sense that we're, the editors are better than the contributors. It's more just everyone benefits from a second pair of eyes on their work, especially that emotional distance that you get from your work as well. Um, so if you're going to start a project with others, make sure that you know you all have the same vision and you all know what gap in the market that you're filling. So for the independent, it was that it's very hard for people at sixth form and in the early stage of university to get paid writing work. Therefore, you need bylines to get paid writing work. So where do you get those bylines? Well, you could write your own blog, but the thing is with running your own blog is your work isn't being edited. So what you publish is what you wrote. Um, and often you'll miss errors or maybe you just have a, a slightly different worldview to other people that are reading your work. And as such, it might not resonate with readers as much as it could do. Um, so the benefit of working on a collaborative blog or website like The Independent is that you actually get someone else to check over your work and make sure that you haven't made any stupid spelling mistakes or that your argument actually makes sense. Um, and then in terms of launching a project like The Independent, um, I would definitely recommend Canva. Canva is a really great graphic design tool um, there are free and paid versions. I think if you're a student, you can get a student license. Um, and that's a great way of creating a consistent brand. Um, so one of the, the major mistakes that I made when the independent first launch was that we had about 10 different um, kind of launches as it were, because I changed the logo about a hundred times. 
Um, I'm finally happy with how it looks and I'm not going to be playing with it anytime soon. But when I first started, started out, we started out on Tumblr, then we moved to WordPress.com and then we moved to WordPress.org. And in the process, I changed the logo about 100 times. So don't do that. If you want people to know who you are and have a really good brand image, then make sure that you know what you want the site to look like before you launch. And um, similarly, other mistakes I've made are don't make, don't spend money on stuff unless you have to. I paid for lots of website themes and different logo options and lots of unnecessary subscriptions to services that I didn't really end up using. So make sure that you're only paying for stuff um, if it's essential. And also, if you're going to be working with people that are writing for free, make sure that you're really honest with them about expectations in terms of how often you want them to contribute. Um, if you're going to have an application process to check that people are good at writing or have a certain level of spelling English, um, spelling punctuation and grammar, make sure that your application process isn't too rigorous because I think a lot of publications put 100 checks or hoops for people to jump through and as such people are put off applying because they think it's too intense. Just basically ask people to submit some school and university work just so that you can get a feel for what they're interested in. Um, ask them for a, a bit of a bio about them um, and any social links that you want to collect as well. Um, and then if you have multiple people contributing to your blog, one thing that I would definitely recommend doing is writing a style guide. So we have one at The Independent and it's basically just a document that says this is how you should format stuff. This is how you should format album titles. This is how you should quote lyrics. Um, and it's just like a checklist for people to use when they're writing for you. So that everyone is writing to the same um, standard and that all the work looks consistent because that's really important for making your publication look professional. If everyone was doing different formatting conventions, it would be a bit sloppy. And especially if you want to grow the publication and reach more people, it's really important that you give the impression that you are a professional uh, media outlet. Um, and then one thing that you can do is use social media to grow your brand. I've already banged on about Twitter, so I won't go on about that too much more. Um, but Twitter is definitely the best place for young journalists. The best ways that you can um, build your Twitter following are going on uh, relevant um, Twitter pages. So things like the Journal Resources account, um, maybe SPA's account um, or your local student paper. Look at who follows them and follow anyone that looks interesting to you, whether that's young journalists or professional journalists. Um, some of them will follow you back, some of them won't, but that, that's fine. Um, and reply to people on Twitter. Get involved in conversations. If you read an article that you think is great, tell the person that wrote it. If you read something on The Guardian's website that blew your mind because it was that good, tweet the link to it, tag the author that wrote it. You never know, like someone with a massive platform might end up engaging with you in a conversation and you might make their day as well for sharing their work. Because I think, especially as a freelance journalist, I've already said it can be quite lonely. So it's actually really nice when people talk to you and they engage with your work and it feels like you're not just throwing your work out into the void. So if there's one takeaway I can give you, it's tell people that you like their work. Um, and then once you've got your own followers on social media, engage with other people that are in a similar position to you. So um, the independent often engages with Empowered Word Journalism, which is a, um, a COVID-19 project. Um, set up last year and it's a great space for women and non-binary people that want to get unpaid writing experience um, so just help each other out if there are podcasts that you like tag them in your posts and um, share their content just start a dialogue create create your own ecosystem of people that you admire and that you want to be like and again rely on those um, journalist communities on Facebook there are also various whatsapp groups I've got one that's just northern journalists so if you want to join that dm me and I'll send you the link that's fine and that's enough for me. So is there any question? Amazing. Thank you very, very much for that, Beth. That, that was very, very insightful. I think it goes without saying that if anybody wanted a copy of that PowerPoint, they could just drop you a message on Twitter or something yeah, like absolutely. that. Would that be all right? Amazing. Um, so, yeah, as I can see in the chat, I've had a couple of questions. I've got a few questions prepared, so we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, so one of the questions we had in the chat was, say if you have one of these... Um, evergreen ideas, uh, uh, evergreen pitches that you, that you mentioned, uh, and one month you pitched a publication and you don't get a response from them. Uh, is it worth re-pitching to the same publication, the same article the following month, or should you just assume they're not interested and try and find somewhere else to publish to? So I think it really depends what the evergreen idea is, because if it's something like a Christmas evergreen feature, obviously you're only going to pitch that in December and it's probably, well, maybe October even, it's probably not going to be relevant in January. So you could reuse it the following year 
um, but definitely don't follow that one up in January because that's going to be irrelevant. Um, I think if an editor hasn't responded to you after you've done the, the one week and then the three day response, you can assume they're not interested. Um, and I would try and pitch it elsewhere. I think a lot of the time reasons that evergreen features don't get picked up is because it's something that could be done in house by a staff writer. So you need to make sure that if it's say it's a list feature on the best friends moments of all time, what is to stop any journalist that's watched friends from writing that you need to be really, really specific and clear why you're the person to write it. So maybe you've got access to someone that was in an episode of Friends that you could do an interview with, for instance, that would be a great hook. And that that's why you, that's why the editor has to commission you as opposed, as opposed to someone else. So I would definitely pitch elsewhere. A lot of the time, I think early career stage journalists pitch the wrong people. So in terms of the editors that you should be sending stuff to, there are editors at publications that have no commissioning power whatsoever. Um, they just edit, they literally change the words on the page they don't agree and commission um, writers so make sure you're pitching someone that has commissioning power often in their twitter bio it will say things like commissioning editor or generally from speaking to other journalists you can kind of get a contact that they've worked with and, and pitch to them so make sure you're selling it to the right person and make sure if it is an evergreen pitch you've done the follow-up um the one week and then the three days but if if you haven't had a response after that i would i would say try elsewhere um, someone's there, someone's asked just personally to you how many pitches did you have to send out before you got your first commission so I was really lucky the first pitch I ever sent out got commissioned um, but that was because I so the first thing I ever wrote for money um, so to be clear I did some unpaid writing for the Telegraph when I was a student which I look back on now and I think that is ridiculous the Telegraph should have paid me for that work but they didn't um, but that's by the by. Um, my first paid commission was for a site called Streaming Wars. And it, I think I got paid £100 for 800 words. Um, and the reason I got that commission was because I saw a tweet from a journalist saying, I'm looking to commission writers to write about Netflix. If you have any ideas, pitch me. Um, and I basically just pitched an idea um, on the back of the Netflix earnings report. Um, so they're just like investors' letters. They're very boring reads, but basically I analysed the data in that and I said, international markets are going to be really important for Netflix can can I write about it and the, and the editor said yes so I was lucky that was I think that was my first pitch um that I tried to do as a freelance journalist um but one thing I would stress is prepare for rejection because freelance journalism is rejection after rejection after ghosted email after ghosted email and that's not any indication of how good you are at writing it's an indication of how busy editors are and how like thinly stretched budgets are um for instance, when I spoke to Paisley um, about the Cosmopolitan piece, she said um, she was only going to commission, I think it was a handful of articles that month. So everyone is vying for the same spot on the website. Um, there aren't unlimited budgets, there aren't unlimited um, commissioning budgets. So be aware of that. Often it's not your idea that sucks, it's just your timing, or maybe you caught the editor on a Monday morning when they had a thousand other emails. It's, it's really often down to just bad timing more than anything else. Um, just a quick uh, technical question. During that presentation, you had a timeline which showed uh, your pictures and like you had like color code and that kind of thing. Someone was just, someone was just asking um, what software you use to generate that timeline. Yeah, so it's, it's literally just an Excel um, Google Doc. So I just went on the calendar and just typed in the dates manually. If you press shift and drag it across, Excel fills in the dates automatically for you. So you can just do that. I mean, I'm happy to share Amazing. a template if people want to DM me on Twitter, I can happily do that, that's fine. Great stuff. Um, another question in the chat um, from Jess, how long do you spend reading news stories each day slash week to generate, to, to generate fresh ideas? Yeah, so I think actually the, the best bit of journalism advice I've ever been given was to read. And I know that sounds so obvious, but one of the things that I think really held me up from getting paid writing work sooner was that I was pitching publications that I'd never read before. Um, so how can you expect an editor to like your idea if, if you, you haven't even given their publication the time of day? So spend the time reading uh, as many news outlets as you possibly can. However, in the current circumstances with COVID, it's really, really stressful to constantly be on the news. It's quite depressing and quite draining. So what I do is I carve out time on the weekend to read. If I see anything that I like during the week on Twitter, I will bookmark it. So you literally just go, um, I think you right click and you can click add, add to bookmarks. 
and that means you can come back and revisit it at a later date. I would definitely recommend doing that. Anything else I see outside of Twitter, I just stick it in a Google Doc and then I go back to all, all of those links on the weekend. Saturday morning is my reading time. Um, and it almost becomes an organic brainstorming session because often when you're reading lots of different pieces on the same thing, so for instance, Bridgerton, you notice common things that have been talked about in the media, but you also spot the gaps. You can see where your opinion could kind of filter through and where there's something that hasn't been said yet. So um, carve out dedicated reading time each week. If you're not very good at sitting down to read the newspapers, set an alarm on your phone that just says like, check BBC News or something like that at lunchtime or if you, if you're a morning person early in the morning, I'm definitely not a morning person. Um, or you could do it in the evening as well, maybe while you're having your tea or, or after tea. Get in the habit of regularly reading work. Um, and again, try and share that work on social media because if you share other people's work on social media, when you do actually have paid bylines, people will share your work in return. Um, just a quick message, uh, sorry, question from Joe, uh, perhaps looking into your music journalism roots. Um, he's found that it's often quite hard to get paid work uh, within music journalism and he's wondering if you had any advice that you could give him on this. Yeah so I haven't done a huge amount of paid journalism, music journalism. I, I love music with my whole heart but again yeah I completely agree it's hard to get paid ops. Um, Eleanor Halls at The Telegraph would definitely recommend pitching to her. She's great. She works with like lots of journalists that haven't got a great deal of experience um, so definitely pitch her. Um, apply for unpaid work experience at a ma magazine. So I did unpaid work experience at Kerrang magazine. It was still useful, even though I didn't get paid for it. Um, if you can afford to take a couple of days annual leave to do that. I mean, it looks good on your CV, if nothing else, and it might lead to future paid ops in the future. Um, email your local paper, see if they are interested in any kind of gig reviews. They might not be able to pay for them, but I think if you can prove yourself as a reliable contributor and, and, and do good live reviews, for instance, you might be able to get other paid writing work out of it, maybe theatre reviews um, and kind of other live events. Great stuff. And then um, someone's asked, is it okay to pitch multiple times to editors that have already rejected your work before? 100%. If I didn't pitch to editors that hadn't had rejected me before, I wouldn't have anyone left to pitch to. It's really, really important not to take pitch rejections personally or to think, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I can't believe I sent that idea. I can never speak to that person ever again. Because if, if you did that, you just wouldn't have anyone to pitch to. There are some pitches that I've sent that I've looked back on and I'm like, oh my God, that's so embarrassing. That was a half thought out idea why did I send that but the editor gets so many emails they're not going to remember you for one they're also very aware that pitching is stressful and that not every pitch is going to land or that sometimes you are going to be so excited and convinced that you're a genius that you're going to send something out before realizing that your idea actually isn't that good um so definitely don't worry about that most editors I think actually a lot of editors that I've gone to like guest talks with have said that they notice people's names um, and if you keep pitching them, they'll notice that you're keen and they might actually be more inclined to take a gamble on you because they know that you're like really dedicated and that you're really committed to journalism. So definitely don't be put off from that. Um, someone's also asked, how many pitches do you typically send out per month? So because I work nine to five, uh, Monday to Friday, I find it quite hard to pitch regularly. Um, I'm setting myself, because I'm, I'm running a newsletter each week um, that kind of comments on my writing journey. So I found that a really good tool to hold myself accountable because if I sit down and write the newsletter and I'm like, I did nothing this week, I feel terrible. So it's been quite a good motivator, um, but I try to aim for five pitches a week uh, and that's on the assumption that most of them won't stick. So I don't want to over pitch and then get loads of commissions and then find myself too busy to write them. So it's, I'm obviously in a fortunate position that I have a day job. Um, I think if you were freelancing on a more full-time basis and you would be sending out more ideas. But actually, I think there's something to be said for actually taking the time to write fewer really well thought out, well-structured pictures than just sending anything, any random thought that comes into your head out. I think there is a balance to be struck. I think it's really important to make sure that your pictures are the, the formatted properly, they're really coherent um, and they're really succinct. I think spend the time to make your pictures good um, rather than worry about how many are hitting like arbitrary quotas. I don't think that's necessarily that important. So I just thought I'd ask a couple of questions on my own. So one of the ones I had down was, at what point in your career did you decide, I want to pursue a career in writing, not just have writing as a hobby? Because um, I'm sure a lot of people in this, in this call might be 
it might just be right it's for a hobby and might want to be making that transition into actual having it as a career so I'm just wondering for you what was the kind of watershed moment when you thought I might generally consider this as an occupation yeah so for me it was probably um in the second year of university so I'd been doing student journalism and I really enjoyed it and I've been writing fiction since I was little um, and telling anyone that would listen that I wanted to be a published author um but it was about second year when all my like friends were applying for grad schemes and things like that, that I started to think, oh, I need to have a I think about my next steps. Um, and I decided to do a journalism qualification. So obviously that cost money. So there was a conversation to be had with my parents about why I'm doing this and why it's important. And we had a whole conversation about careers. So that was probably the point where I got serious about it. Um, I think in terms of choosing whether or not to do a journalism qualification I think try your hand at freelancing first because I think it would be a bit of a waste of money if you then decided journalism wasn't for you um so yeah definitely try freelancing while you're still a student there's no harm in trying to pitch places while you're a student there are lots of great student journalists I know that have national bylines that's not a reason to be put off um in terms of writing for me like I've kind of got a dream job like I work in marketing for a creative media uni which is very similar to the kind of interest that I have outside of my day job so I, I get to write about music for work and I get to write about music for a hobby so it's great and um, not everyone is is as lucky um don't be afraid to take a writing job that isn't in your dream sector so for instance like a trade magazine like you could write about tractors for a year and and get some really good writing experience but you might not be mad about tractors but doesn't mean you shouldn't take the job um, especially in the current climate I think any kind of form of paid writing work is great and you should try it Fantastic. And I'm just a little bit conscious of time. So I think we've probably got time for one more question. Um, so obviously today you've given us all so much, so much good advice, you know, so, so many things to think about. Um, I'm just wondering what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received in your career? Well, maybe, maybe the read advice, but I've already said that. So I need to think of something else. Um, maybe I can say something about um, like mentors and people that you look up to. Um, I think a lot of people are quite inclined to put their favourite writers on a pedestal and think oh, I really want to be like them but they don't ever like engage with them or interact with them on social media so if you love say Dolly Alderton and she's your favourite writer reply to her columns say like this I really like this one this week or if you read an article by Surin Kale on The Guardian that you love tweet her say that you really enjoyed it because you never know who is reading your work um, I think the best example of this is I love Terry White I think she's amazing she's the editor of Empire magazine um, and I've been going to all of her guest workshops that um, master classes that she's been doing during lockdown and then she subscribed to my newsletter so she's reading my work which is mad but like that just goes to show that there are people out there that like people on the other end of a Twitter account are a human being they are reading and engaging in the same way that you're reading and engaging. So be mindful of how you present yourself on social media, but also don't be afraid to tag people that you really like want to be like. Um, and don't be afraid to DM them asking for advice either. If you do that, make sure you follow them because someone did that to me the other day and they didn't even follow me. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I suppose that's as good a time as any to end this conversation. I think that's some very, very significant and very, very wise words there. So thank you very much for spending the last hour or so with us, Beth. We really do appreciate it. Uh, and this this was the final the final session of Spark this year. So thank you very much for everyone for joining. This was my first time ever hosting any events whatsoever. So it's been quite a long day, uh, but a very fulfilling day. So thank you very much for everyone joining in. Uh, of course, thank you to the speakers as well, because uh, obviously I couldn't have done it without them. And then looking on to the next, uh, about an hour away or so, uh, we have our awards session in which we'll be giving awards for best publication, best journalist, best newcomers, uh, all that good stuff on our Twitter. So our Twitter is at SPA Journalism. Be sure to just give it a quick look in the next hour or so. Maybe see some people that you could perhaps follow, some of the new journalists coming up, some of the best people on the scene. But yeah, thank you again, Beth, for joining us and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks for having me. See you guys. <laughs>